Here's my preaching on the roles of men and women in society and what maturity as a man actually looks like. Because there seems to be all sorts of ridiculous ideas these days about what maturity as a man looks like. Well, God tells us what maturity as a man looks like. He says, as someone who knows and understands me. Read that passage for yourself. Let not the mighty man glory in his might, nor the rich man glory in his riches, nor the strong man glory in his strength, but let him who glories glory in this, that he knows and understands me, for in these do I delight, saith Jehovah. So the knowledge of God and closeness to God is the definition of manhood. <laughs> we have a generation of posers that have nothing to say that are running around um, without knowing anything about God. They have nothing to say about the Most High. And um, what a tragedy. And so women follow men, and that's what we see in the women. Women running around, putting on an act, poserhood galore, and no one has anything to say about God. Um, and um, what a tragedy. The greatest tragedy of all time, because you're going home to God. At the end of this life, you will stand before God. Like... I always love to fast forward people to Judgment Day. Like, that just blows away so much dumb thinking of this current existence. Fast forward to Judgment Day. Okay? The brink of eternity. You will be standing before God. And you won't have your house. You won't have your kids. You won't have your wife. You won't have your business, you won't have your company, you won't have any possessions, you won't have anything except you and God. <laughs> and <laughs> if you are not thinking about that in as early an age as possible, your life is going to be pretty darn cheesy. And it's going to be pretty, pretty darn lame. And it's not going to mean anything in world history. Um, and, uh, but we just, it just seems to me that we have, um, above all, people are living to please people. Oh, the sheeple effect. When will we ever get slightly away from it? Everyone living to please others. And God has just been speaking. It is better to trust in Jehovah than to put confidence in man. Um, but it is disgusting what, is, what people are esteeming these days. It is absolutely silly. It's actually laughable in my sight what people are esteeming these days. It is absolutely cringeworthy. Possessions. Oh, he's got a nice house. Oh, he's a hardworking guy. I'm like, this is the most retarded thing I've ever seen in my life. We have, more, we have more stuff down here, and we have far less closeness to God. We have far less knowledge about God. Like We have far less men that have anything to say about God than ever before in the history of the universe. Um, it, it's really quite laughable slash weepable. Um, and, uh, you know, one of the, uh, the quickest ways to tell where someone is at, is this simple question. How do you react? What do you have to say when I mention to you the name Jesus? And you will instantly have your answer as to how grown up the man is. Because if the man is very grown up, he will have a ton to say about Jesus. He will have so much to say about Jesus because he's been enlightened, he's been close to God, and he sees what the angels see. Did you know that the angels see the full glory of Jesus mathematically in all of world history, in all, in all the stories and testimonies, they, they see the full glory of Jesus constantly, day and night in world history, and they never stop worshiping. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is filled with his glory. So if you ask any man in this universe, what do you have to say about Jesus? 
If he is in complete darkness, he will have nothing to say or he won't even want to talk to you. He's dead. He is literally a dead man. The Bible, I, I cannot get over how strong and how obvious the terms of the Bible are between a Christian and a non-Christian. The great trap that we have in this modern age is that the blessing of the Christian heritage is so abundant that the non-Christians now in society are, are, just, are just literally riding the coattails of the blessing of all the Christians you know, around them and before them. But if we were to transport them into a completely non-Christian nation, like some of the countries in the Middle East and some of the countries of Africa and places that are totally devoid of, of the blessing of God, like Cambodia, you know, places that are steeped in Hinduism and false religion, and that they're just ransacked with poverty, disease, corrupt government, dirt everywhere, non-blessing, filth, they would, they would scream bloody murder. They would be kicking and screaming. If you took any of the non-Christian Hollywood crowd out of Hollywood in the United States and teleported them to a nation that doesn't have any Christian heritage, they would scream bloody murder. They would freak out day and night. They would not be able to stand one week. They wouldn't be able to handle it because they would just be overwhelmed by the poverty and the curse and the, the, the fallout of a sinful nation. Um, so, um, but the difference between a Christian and a non-Christian is death and life. As in, the non-Christian is dead, the Christian is alive. The non-Christian, this is what the world doesn't understand. This is the biggest thing that most people don't understand about the gospel. Most people think that Christianity is a commitment to a set of rules and behaviors which they don't want to have in their life. The biggest, most important truth about Christianity is that the curse of God gets lifted off of the individual's life. They're going to heaven and not to hell. That's the most important thing. That's what we call salvation. But for the purposes of this life in which we live, the most important thing is the curse of God has been lifted off of that soul and everything around them. And it has now been replaced by blessing and favor. Now they are God's child adopted into his family. Did you know that before that, they had to be the child of someone? Whose child were they? They were the child of Satan. There is nothing in extreme about this story. Your ire, Jesus said it over and over again. You are either a child of Satan or you are a child of God. Why are these terms being preached on in our churches? Why are our churches talking about better marriages and how, you know, you can get more money and how you can be happier and how you can have, you know, more peace and how we can, you know... Here's a fascinating little tidbit, you know, that we got from the Bible. Let's make a joke out of it. And let's, like, the difference between a non-Christian and a Christian is the curse of God is upon the non-Christian. The blessing of God is upon the Christian. The most important thing about the gospel is the favor of God or the non-favor of God. Period. That, that is everything. Okay? And, um, and uh, I'm sick and tired of, of people thinking that Christianity is a set of things that you do or don't do rather than an actual contract that God has laid out to all of mankind saying, those who are in Christ Jesus are children of God and are blessed by the Most High supernaturally, okay? And those who are not in Christ Jesus by the confession of Him as Lord and, and, and asking Him to forgive them of all their sins. It's so simple. Salvation is so simple. Okay? Are under the curse of the devil. And then, and then the fruit of that, okay? Let me describe some of the fruits of blessing. What does it look like for a country? What are the fruits of blessing and what are the fruits of the curse? Well, the fruits of blessing will be peace of mind, peace in your soul, the fruits of the Spirit. You can read them for yourself in the Bible. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Okay? Right thinking. Okay? Um, 
strength over temptation, righteousness, desire to do good, holy desire, desire to live for Jesus, you know, I could go on, health, physical health, um, prosperity even, wisdom on how to take care of the material things of the earth so that we can prosper and share together. And then on the other side, the curses, of course, disease, sickness, mental health, confusion, fear, doubt, anger, hatred, sexual impurity, wrong desires, gluttony, selfishness, disease, poverty, and then it, it, it doesn't take, enough, it doesn't take a, a really awakened person to look at the nations of the world and just do the math. Look at the nations and the, his, and the nations whose history is steeped in non-Christianity, and that's where you find the most poverty, the most disease, the most famine, the most curse, the, the, le, the, you know, the, less, the least amount of development, the less, the, you know, less technology, less prosperity. So that's why the gospel, that's why faith in Jesus Christ and the confession of Jesus Christ as Lord is the most important transformational act on planet Earth. Um, and uh, I marvel at how simple it is to teach it to children in schools, get them early. That's the simplest way to see an entire generation be blessed. Allow me to preach on the, the nature of man and how crappy man really is. Oh boy, this is going to feel good to preach on. This is not preached on nearly enough these days. The crappy nature of man and the weakness of man and the sinfulness of man and the patheticness of man compared to holy God and Jesus Christ, who is God, is not being preached on nearly enough today. It's almost like it's the giant elephant in the room that no one is willing to talk about because we are all weak, fleshly men. <laughs> and I just, but I just want to preach on how pathetic man is compared to God. Um, and if we don't get down on our knees and call up to God regularly for mercy, um, we are just so disgustingly retarded. It really is hard to believe sometimes. Um, oh boy. Anyways, so. Um, The obvious thing to state right now, ladies and gentlemen, gentlemen in particular, is that men are sucking wind these days, spiritually. <laughs> in general, men are more or less sucking wind spiritually. And it's all a result of lack of prayer, lack of prayer, lack of prayer. Shall we say that one more time? It's all a direct result of lack of prayer. Men that don't spend any time waiting on Jehovah, on their knees, in meditation, on your bed, whatever way you're led to do it. Um, it's terrible. It's terrible. Um, and uh, it does show up, and I, I do want to preach a little bit on physical manifestations of um, separation from God. This is another thing that is not preached on nearly enough in church. Um, folks, I just, I just love talking about things that are true, that people don't like to talk about. It's like, did you know that the reason ugliness, physical ugliness exists in the world is because of sin. 
Okay? The reason physical ugliness exists and, and defects in the body and just ugliness in general, ugly bodies, ugly faces, the reason ugliness exists in the world is because of sin. And when, when people are non-Christian and they live lives of sin apart from God, it shows up on their face. Their physical flesh and their physical face literally rots faster than the one who is, first of all, forgiven in Christ Jesus and by His grace living a life that is close to God and abstaining as much as possible from sin. I cringe sometimes. I fear that the standards have fallen so low that sometimes I wonder if there's even a hope for people falling in love and having the romance of their dreams on any level. It really does, and it shows up on the face. I just, you know, it's, um... I just, and I just think, it's almost like people need to be more honest with themselves and they need to be more honest with each other. Sometimes I think even in the church we excuse, we apologize for too much. And we excuse too much and we pretend to love people by patting them on the back and, you know, sort of accepting them and saying, oh, they're there, you know. I'll love you even though you're like completely hideous and like completely like unattractive and completely undesirable to be around. Even though what they really need is a good, like, what are you doing? Like, you're hurting yourself. Like, you're, you're hurting yourself with this behavior. I just, I just feel sometimes, folks, like the standards have gotten so low. Like, even for physical appearance, and just physical appearance and so much... So much nastiness and physical appearance is the result of sin, and no one preaches on this. No one preaches on the power of Jesus Christ and the gospel is the redemption of mankind. Like, it's total healing, you know? Just, uh, oh, it's disgusting what we have today. It's just disgusting. It's, it, it, it feels like a generation of whiners. It says, oh, don't judge me. You're not allowed to judge anyone. Folks, if we never judge each other, if we never sharpen each other, if we never confess the honest truth, like, boy, I'm really not attracted to you because you just look and behave and talk completely nasty. Like, if we don't say any of these things, I'm like, what an ugly cesspool we, we are creating. The, the moment we get away from talking about the sin nature of man and the redemption, the necessary redemption of Jesus Christ, the moment we have committed ourselves to ugliness galore, and no one's going to be happy, because no human soul is happy with ugliness all around them day and night. If you go to a godless nation, like, and you don't have the Spirit of God to help you stomach it and make it through the nastiness, you will, you will feel like puking everywhere you turn because of the ugliness, the sheer ugliness. Um, It's, it's not like God has not provided an efficient solution. Like it's, like, it's not like, you know, it's difficult. It's, salvation is the easiest thing even a child can do it. It takes less than five seconds. And so, um, you know, Jesus always started by saying repent. Like, <laughs> Jesus always started by addressing the sin nature of man. <laughs> Saying there's a problem. 
There's a root inside of you that needs to get pulled out. Now, in this day and age, the dumbest thing that we have in this day and age and is that you're not allowed to speak against anything. It is, it's the stupidest thing ever. You're not allowed to speak against anything. You're not allowed to call something sin. Like, it's gotten so bad, folks. It's gotten so bad that even what the Bible clearly classified as terrible, homosexuality, is, is now, now people are even patting that on the back. That's bad. I mean, folks, I look at the way ladies are dressing now, and it's pretty bad. Like, it's just, like, you know, thank you for sharing. Like, it just, um, Of course, the people to always blame are fathers. That is always the case. That has always been the case from the dawn of time. Okay? Typically, the number one people on planet Earth to blame for all the world's problems are the biological fathers. That had kids, didn't raise them properly, didn't feed them the truth adequately, didn't even understand the universe themselves, didn't even know Jesus Christ, didn't even know what was going on, didn't know how to properly nourish and feed and protect their sons and daughters spiritually. And on and on it goes, okay, until people get around the Heavenly Father and fix the whole thing. Men have always been the number one problem, okay, because women will always follow the men. If you have ten men in a room that all say, we're going this way, and you have ten women in the room with them. The women will follow. Because if they don't, the guys are stronger than them. Like, it's just, it's not complicated, ladies and gentlemen. God ordained it to be that way. God said way back at the Garden of Eden, He said to Eve, Your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. Eve has a God-ordained desire to follow a male. God said so. Don't argue with God. Women in the, in the audience, don't argue. It's obvious. That is your truest desire. You want to follow a male man who is godly. And you want him to be around. And you want him to be fatherly. And you want him to be proper. So, whenever there is a spiritual problem in a country, it's because the men are sucking wind. The men are not seeking God. The men are into idols. I marvel at how bloody simple spiritual follow actually is. Here's how simple it actually is. You have a brain. You have a thought life. And you have a precise number of minutes while you live that is spent with an active thought life. You know, non-sleep, we might say. What is going through here? What is in your thoughts? What percentage of your thoughts are centered around God and the Trinity, Jesus Christ, the Holy Ghost, God the Father, and His glory, His truth, His works, everything that He is and all that He does, and all of His commands and all of His instructions, and the beauty of Him and the desirability of Him, and hearing His voice and communicating back to Him, being in fellowship with Him, focused on Him, thinking about Him, hearing from Him, learning more about Him, talking about Him with others. What percentage of your waking, living, breathing minutes is in that arena versus some other dumb arena? Like cars. 
my Chevrolet that I, I'm wanting to uh, fix up and pretty up. The next woman that I'm interested in. The next task I want to accomplish in my company. The next item I hope to acquire. The next destination I hope to go to. The next child I want to have. Many times people worship mortals. They worship another human being or set of human beings. Okay? Take your pick, whatever it is. Whatever it is. It is one or more things that are other than the God channel. <laughs> Think of it like watching TV. How much time do you spend watching the God channel versus the other channels? I'm talking to men. Because men are the leaders of the world. What are men watching these days? What are men thinking about these days? <laughs> it's like, are they even thinking at all? <laughs> so. I have to laugh sometimes, people. Like, it's laughable what people think is cool, apart from God. It's actually laughable. And should Jesus Christ tarry, and I, by His grace, if He's willing, lets me live a long life, I pray for that. You know, hopefully at age 100, I'll still be laughing by the grace of Jesus. Like, oh yeah. Yeah. It's really cool. It's really cool to be a complainer. It's really cool to be an unbeliever. Oh yeah, so sad, so satisfying in life to be a to be a complainer, to be a cynic. Oh yeah, it's really cool to like, you know, swear at work. Oh yeah, it's so cool. It's just so cool. Yeah, it's really cool. To drink a bunch of poisonous liquid that makes you topsy-turvy? Oh yeah, that's so cool! It's so cool to suck nicotine into your lungs, it's so cool! So cool! So cool to be addicted to things that you're not free from? Oh, it's such a so cool, man! Be cool! It's so cool to be angry at people? Isn't that cool? Like, it's just so cool to be like, angry at people and like talking nasty things about it. Isn't it cool to gossip? It's just so cool. It's so cool. It's so cool to be working, you know, in like, you know, insurance. And it's so cool to be like collecting money from others. It's so cool. Like it's just so cool, man. It's so cool. It's so cool to be talking about, you know, this ball that gets kicked around and thrown around between a bunch of people day and night. It's just so cool. It's so cool, man. It's so, here's another one that's common. It's so cool to not be in love. It's so cool to be like, you know, not in love. Like, oh, it's just so cool to be like tough and like, I'm not in love with anyone. I'm not in love with God. I'm not in love with, you know, someone in this world. Oh, it's just so cool, man. It's so cool to be tough, man. It's so cool. Oh. Okay. 
I, I, I never cease to marvel at how everyone really is ridiculously frail. All of us. Every single one of us on this giant planet are ridiculously frail and ridiculously weak and ridiculously tiny and ridiculously childlike compared to God. Above all, pride is the stupidest thing that is ever possible in the history of the universe. People should be far more loving. They should be far more happy. One thing I really hate is hatred. A hatred of sin is right. Okay? What non-Christians don't understand is that you are powerless over feelings of hatred until you receive Jesus Christ. This is what I, I can't stop preaching on is the the inside-out transformation of the gospel. Christianity is not you attempting to become a nicer person. No. When you confess that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, as the Bible tells you to do, God supernaturally pulls hatred out of your heart. And he pulls all the other sinful, nasty things out of your heart, and he replaces them with the fruit of the Holy Ghost, which is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Okay? I think the problem with many non-Christians that grew up in a non-Christian home is that they, they are addicted to that environment. It's like a starving kid that grew up on nothing but one kind of being his whole life. He was impoverished, he just grew up on one kind of being his whole life and never knew that there was a feast somewhere. You know, it's almost like being blinded by the light. It's like, whoa, I had no idea life could be this peaceful this happy, this love-filled. Like, why was I so addicted to hatred and gossip and self-promotion and lust and greed and, you know, all the other? Above all, I am weary of cheesy conversations, aren't you? Um, if you can't talk about the deepest things of life daily, it's unsatisfying. It's just totally unsatisfying. I'm asking God for deep conversations with deep people daily. Tell me something deep about yourself. Ask me a deep question that you don't know the answer to. Like, let's get some serious satisfaction as a collective unit of people on this planet. called asking deep questions and getting deeply satisfying answers. And don't stop until you get your total satisfaction. Okay. No more shallow junk for me. No way. It's just stupid. It's just totally stupid. <laughs>